Hello and welcome to our video summarising all you need to know about William Shakespeare's play As You Like It. My name is Barbara Njau and in this video we'll examine this play in detail. We'll begin with a little contextual information about Shakespeare himself before going into the detail of the play's plot, its characters and important themes you should be aware of. This video is useful if you're studying this play for your coursework or exams, so let's get started. Now, as You Like It is a pastoral comedy by William Shakespeare and it's believed to have been written in 1599 and first published in 1623. And it follows the heroine Rosalind as she flees persecution in her uncle's court, accompanied by her cousin Celia to find safety and eventually love in the Forest of Arden. In the forest, they encounter a variety of memorable characters, notably the melancholy traveller Jacques, who speaks of many of famous as Shakespeare's most famous speeches. So, for example, he states, all the world's a stage and too much a good thing. A firm favourite among Shakespeare's comedies and featuring some of its best loved characters, as you like it, runs the glorious gamut of pastoral romance. A series of mistaken identities and mishaps in the Forest of Arden ultimately sees new friendships formed and families and lovers reunited. Now to begin with a little bit about Shakespeare himself. He was born in 1564 in Stratford-upon-Avon and he passed away in 1616 and William was the third child of John Shakespeare and Mary Arden and he had two older sisters and three younger brothers. Shakespeare, when he was older, married Anne Hathaway. However, he was 18 when he married her and Anne was 26 and, as it turns out, pregnant. And the first child was a daughter named Susanna and then they had twins. However, one of those twins did die later on. And in 1599, William Shakespeare and his business partners built the Globe Theatre. Now, with regards to the play itself, as you like it, let's briefly talk about the plot as a whole. It begins with Orlando, the youngest son of the recently deceased Sir Roland de Bois, who's treated harshly by his eldest brother, Oliver. Bitter and angry, Orlando challenges a court wrestler, Charles, to a fight. And when Oliver learns of the fight, Oliver tells Charles to injure Orlando if possible. Duke Frederick has recently deposed his brother, Duke Signor, as head of the court. But he's allowed Signor's daughter, Rosalind, to remain, and she and Celia, the new Duke's daughter, watch the wrestling competition. During the match, Rosalind falls in love with Orlando who beats Charles and Rosalind gives Orlando a chain to wear and in turn he's overcome with love. Shortly after, Orlando is warned of his brother's plot against him and seeks refuge in the forest of Arden. At the same time and seemingly without cause, Duke Frederick banishes Rosalind. She decides to seek shelter in the same forest of Arden with Celia and they both disguise themselves, Rosalind as the young man Ganymede and Celia as shepherdess sister Alina. Touchstone, the court fall, also goes with them. In the Forest of Arden, the wearing cousins happen upon Silvius, a lovesick shepherd. He's in the act of declaring his feelings for Phoebe, a scornful shepherdess. And Ganymede buys the lease to the property of an old shepherd who needs someone to manage his estate. Ganymede and Alina set up a home in the forest and not far away and unaware of newcomers, Duke Signor is living a simple outdoor life with his fellow exiled courtiers and huntsmen. Their merriment is interrupted by the arrival of Orlando, who seeks nourishment for himself and his servant, and the two men are welcomed by the outlaw courtiers. Ganymede and Alina find verses addressed to Rosalind hung on the forest branches by Orlando, and Ganymede finds Orlando and proposes to cure Orlando of his love. To do this, Orlando will woo Ganymede if, as if he were Ro Rosalind, even though he really is Rosalind in disguise. Orlando consents and visits Ganymede slash Rosalind every day for his lesson. In the meantime, the shepherdess Phoebe has fallen from Ganymede, while the shepherd Silvius still pursues her. Furthermore, Touchstone the court fool has dazzled a country girl, Audrey, with his courtly manners, and Audrey deserts her young suitor, William, for him. When Duke Frederick hears Orlando has disappeared at the same time as Rosalind and Celia, he orders Oliver to the forest to seek his brother. In the forest, Orlando saves Oliver's life, injuring his arm in the process. Oliver runs to Ganymede and Lena in the forest and relates this news, and Rosalind, disguised as Ganymede, is overcome with her feelings for Orlando. Celia, disguised as Lena, and Oliver quickly fall in love with each other, and Rosalind decides that it's time to end a game with Orlando and devises a plan in which everyone will get married. As Ganymede, Rosalind promises Phoebe that they will marry, and Celia will marry Oliver, Touchstone will marry Audrey, and Orlando will marry Rosalind. She makes Phoebe promise that if they for some reason don't get married, Phoebe will marry Silvius instead. On the day of the wedding, with the help of the god Hymen, Rosalind reappears in her female clothes. Duke Signor gives her away to Orlando, while Phoebe accepts Silvius. 
Orlando's older brother returns from college with the news that Celia's father, Duke Ferdinand, has left court to become a hermit. Thus everyone's is happy, except perhaps for Phoebe, who marries someone she doesn't love, and Silvius, who marries someone who doesn't love him. The play ends with a joyful dance to celebrate all the four marriages. Now to go into a little bit more detail for each act. So let's start with Act 1, Scene 1. In the orchard of the house of Oliver Du Bois, Orlando Du Bois complains to Adam, an old family servant, about how he's been treated by his elder brother Oliver, who according to the father's will wants to see to it that Orlando has to be taught all the ways of being a gentleman, as Oliver has been doing for their brother Jacques. Yet Orlando has been kept at home like a peasant. Oliver enters and Orlando tells him that the spirit of my father, which I think is within me, begins to mutiny against his servitude. The two brothers argue and suddenly Orlando grabs Oliver and demands that either he receive education and treatment due to him or else he wants the thousand crowns that he's entitled to according to his father's will and Oliver dismisses him with a curt will sir get you in. Turning to Adam he insultingly sneers get you with him you old dog. Orlando and Adam leave and Oliver's anger is interrupted when his servant Dennis enters with the news that Charles the Duke's wrestler is at the door. Oliver summons the wrestler and the two of them discuss news of the court and the old duke has been banished by his younger brother and gone into exile in the forest of Arden and has been joined by some of his loyal lords where they live like the old Robin Hood of England and fleet the time of carelessly as it did in the golden world. The old duke's daughter Rosalind however has remained at court with her inseparable companion Celia, the usurper's daughter. Charles then says that the new duke has announced that wrestling matches will be held at the court the next day. Moreover, Charles has heard that Orlando intends to come in and disguise and try to fall with him. He warns Oliver that though he does not want to harm Orlando, he will be required to do best for him for his own honour. Oliver assures Charles that he will need not be concerned. Charles agrees and he also agrees to take care of Orlando and leaves. Now in Act 1, Scene 2, Celia, the daughter of Duke Frederick, and Rosalind, the daughter of the deposed Duke, are talking on the loan before the Duke's palace. Celia chides Rosalind for not being sufficiently merry, and Rosalind, although she grieves because of her father's exiles, promises to try to be cheerful. Touchstone, the court clown, enters and joins the repartee, t- and telling them that, or rather telling Celia, that Frederick has summoned her. They're joined by Le Beau, a courtier who brings news of a wrestling contest that's begin to, to begin shortly. Duke Frederick, Charles and Orlando and the members of the court arrive and Frederick suggests that the young women, Celia and Rosalind, dissuade the challenger from the contest as he'll be seriously injured. They try to do so, but Orlando will not be convinced, saying, I shall do my friends no wrong, for I have none to lament me. To everyone's surprise, Orlando wins the fall and wishes to try a second, but Charles has to be carried out. Frederick asks to know Orlando's name and becomes furious when he discovers that Orlando is the son of Roland de Bois. Celia, Rosalind and Orlando are then left alone on the lawn and Rosalind, whose father Orlando as his soul, gives Orlando her necklace to wear as a reward for his gallantry. They're instantly attracted to each other and symbolically Orlando is taken by Rosalind in spite of the fact that he is actually not overthrown by Charles. As the women leave, Le Beau rushes in to warn Orlando that the Duke is angry and it counsels him to leave immediately. Orlando also learns that the Duke has lately taken displeasure against Rosalind too. He decides to return home. In Act 1, Scene 3, shortly afterwards, we hear Rosalind confess her love for Orlando to Celia, and she begs Celia to love him also for her sake. The two then talk of love, however, it's interrupted by the Duke's furious entrance, and he tells them that they are banished from the palace. Rosalind protests that she's no traitor, and Celia begs her father to relent, but he's adamant, and he repeats his threats once more before leaving. Celia is determined that the two girls will not be separated, and so she proposes to leave with Rosalind to go and join her deposed father in the forest of Arden. When they both realise that they are fearful of the dangers of the journey, they decide to disguise themselves. Rosalind will dress as a boy, taking the name of Ganymede, and Celia will dress as a young farm girl and use Alina as her name. Moreover, Celia will convince Touchstone, one of her father's gestures, to join them, and happy and excited, they go off and pack. Now in Act 2, Scene 1, the banished Duke Signor expounds on the wonders of life in the forest. He tells his associates that he prefers forest dwelling and he reminds them that their existence in Arden is free from danger and the greatest worry here is nothing worse than the cold winter wind. The woods provide Duke Signor with everything he needs from conversation to education to spiritual edification. One lord arrives and announces the melancholy Lord Jacques has seconded his observations, declaring Signor 
guiltier of usurpation than his loveless brother, Duke Frederick. Duke Sunor, in humour, asks of one of his men to bring him Jack because arguing with him is much fun. In Act 2, Scene 2, back at court, Duke Frederick is enraged to discover the disappearances of Celia, Rosalind and Touchstone. He can't believe that the three could leave the court without any, any notice. One attending lord reports that Celia's gentlewoman overheard Celia and Rosalind complimenting Orlando, and she speculates that wherever the women are, Orlando is likely to be with them. Frederick uses this information and commands that Olivia Oliver be recruited to find his brother. In Act 2, Scene 3, Orlando returns to his former home, where the servant Adam greets him. News of the young man's victory over Charles precedes him, and Adam worries that Orlando's strength and bravery will be the keys of his downfall. Adam begs him not to enter Oliver's house. Oliver, he reports, having learned of Orlando's triumph, p plans to burn the place where Orlando sleeps in hopes of destroying Orlando with it. Orlando then wanders about his fate, speculating that without a home, he may be destined to eke out a living as a common highway robber, and Adam suggests that the two of them take the road with modest life savings. Touched by Adam's constant service, Orlando agrees and they leave. In Act 2, Scene 4, Rosalind, Celia and Touchstone arrive, but, and they are safe but exhausted, in the forest of Ardeen. The three sit down to rest, but before long, they're interrupted by two shepherds, young Corin and Silvis. The shepherds are so wrapped up in the conversation about Silvis's hopeless love and devotion to the shepherdess Phoebe that they do not notice the three travellers. Corin, who claims to have loved a thousand times, tries to advise Silvis, but the young man, maintaining that his companion cannot possibly understand the death of his feelings, wanders off. Rosalind, Celia and Touchstone approach Corin and ask where they might find a place to rest and when Corin admits that his master's modest holdings are up for sale, Rosalind and Celia decide to buy the property. In Act 2, Scene 5, as Armin strolls through the forest of Ardeen with Jacques in tow, he sings a song inviting his listeners to lie with him. Jacques begs to continue but Armin hesitates claiming that the song will only make Jacques melancholy. The warning does not deter him, who proudly claims that he can suck melancholy out of a song as a, weevil, as a weasel sucks eggs. While the other lords in attendance prepare for Duke Signor's meal, Armians leads them in fishing for the song, in finishing the song. Jacques follows with a verse set to the same tune, which he himself wrote. In it, he chides those foolish enough to leave their wealth and leisure for life in the forest, and Amiens leaves to summon the Duke to dinner. In Act 2, Scene 6, Orlando and Adam enter the forest of Ardeen. Adam is exhausted from travel and claims he will soon die from hunger, and Orlando assures his loyal servant that he will find him food. Before he sets off to hunt, Orlando fears leaving Adam lying in the bleak air and carries him off to shelter. In Act 2, Scene 7, Duke Signor returns to camp to find that Jacques has disappeared. When a lord reports that Jacques has been seen in good spirits, the Duke worries that happiness in one who is typically so miserable portends discord in the universe. Just after the Duke commands the Lord to find Jacques, Jacques appears. He is uncharacteristically merry and explains that while wandering through the forest he met before. He repeats the fool's witty observations about Lady Fortune and proclaims that he himself would like to be a fool. In this position, Jacques reasons he would be able to speak his mind freely, thereby cleansing the foul body of the infected wound with the medicine of his criticism. The Duke laments this and reminds Jacques that he himself is guilty of many of the evils he would inevitably criticise in others and their playful argument is interrupted when Orlando barges onto the scene, drawing his sword and demanding food. The Duke asks whether Orlando's rudeness is a function of distress or bad breeding and, once Orlando has gained composure, invites him to partake the banquet. Orlando goes off to fetch Adam and Duke Signor observes that he and his men are far from alone in their unhappiness. There's much strife in the world. Jacques replies that the world is a stage and all the men and women are merely players. All humans pass through stages of infancy, childhood and adulthood. They experience love and seek honour but all eventually succumb to the debilitation of old age and mere oblivion. Orlando returns with Adam and all begin to eat and the Duke soon realises that Orlando is the son of Sir Roland, the Duke's old friend, and heartily welcomes him. In Act 3, Scene 1, at court, Duke Frederick threatens Oliver that if he does not bring back Orlando, dead or living, he will be in trouble. In that event, Olivia, Oliver's possessions will revert to Frederick. In Act 3, Scene 2, Orlando runs through the forest of Ardeen, mad with love. He hangs poems that he has composed in Rosalind's honour in every tree, hoping that passerbys will see her virtue witnessed everywhere. 
Corinne and Touchstone enter, but are too engrossed in conversation about the relative merits of court and country life to pay attention to Orlando's verses. Corinne argues that polite manners at court are of no consequence in the country. Touchstone asks him to provide evidence to support this thesis and then challenges the shepherd's reasoning. Rosalind enters, dis disguised as Ganymede. She reads one of Orlando's poems, which compares her to a priceless jewel. Touchstone mocks the verse, claiming that he could easily churn out a comparable succession of rhymes. He does so with couplets that liken Rosalind to a cat in heat, a thorny rose and a prostitute whose transport on the pillory to a on a cart. Rosalind rebukes Touchstone for his meddling, and just then Celia enters, disguised as a shepherdess Alina. She too has found one of Orlando's verses and reads it out loud. The women agree that the verses are terribly lit written, yet Rosalind is eager to learn the identity of the author. Celia teases her friend hesitating to reveal the secret until Rosalind is nearly insane with anticipation. Celia then admits that Orlando has penned these poems and Rosalind can hardly believe it. And like a smitten schoolgirl, she asks a dozen questions about her lover, wanting to know everything. Celia does her best to answer the questions despite Rosalind's incessant inter interruptions. Orlando and Jack then enter. Hiding, the women eavesdrop on the conversation and Orlando and Jacques clearly do not care for one another's company and exchange a series of insults. Jacques dislikes Orlando's sentimental love, declaring it the worst possible fault, while Orlando scoffs at Jacques's melancholy. Eager to part, Jacques walks off into the forest, leaving Orlando alone, and Rosalind decides to confront Orlando and she approaches him as a young man, Ganymede, and speaks of a man that's been carving the name Rosalind on trees. Orlando insists that he is a man, and she claims to recognise the sym symptoms of this love illness. She then speaks to him, and Orlando says that he is in love. And she also, as Ganymede says, that she has experienced love. However, he says that she's dressed too neatly to be madly in love. Ganymede also promises to cure him of this love, if he promises to woo Ganymede as if Ganymede were Rosalind. As Ganymede, Rosalind vows to make the very idea of love unappealing to Orlando by acting the part of a fickle lover, and Orlando is quite sure that he is beyond cure, but he takes the challenge anyway. In Act 3, Scene 3, there are other less romantic lovers in the Forest of Arden. For example, there's a poetic and philosophical Touchstone and the earthly Audrey. Yielding to instinct, Touchstone has wooed and finally won Audrey, perhaps Shakespeare's most dull-witted country wench. The pair hurry along to meet Sir Oliver Martex, the vicar of the neighbouring village, and are followed by Jacques, who is amused by the incongruous pair. When Sir Oliver arrives, they discover that there's no one to give the bride away, so Jacques offers his service, but he recommends that they be married by a priest. Totstrand, however, would prefer it that way, and says aside that not being well married, it would be a good excuse for me hereafter to leave my wife. So he decides to find a proper person to marry him and Audrey, and he goes off with Audrey and Jacques, merrily singing and leaving behind the bemused Sir Oliver. In Act 3, Scene 4, when this scene opens, Rosalind is at the point of tears. She's sitting at the forest of Celia, waiting for Orlando, who's not kept his first appointment for the love cure. Celia teases her friend about Orlando's unreliability. However, Rosalind reveals that she has met her father in the forest and says that he didn't recognise her in disguise. She talks of her father's plight and his presence in the forest, which don't seem to concern her very unduly. She can only think of Orlando. Now in Act 3, Scene 5, Silvius has confessed his love to Phoebe, however his words fall on hostile ears. As the scene opens, he pleads with her not to reject him so bitterly. Silvius, remember, is a shepherd and Phoebe is a shepherdess. Rosalind and Celia, both disguised, also enter along with Corin to watch Phoebe's cruel response to Silvius. She mocks his hyperbolic language, asking why he fails to fall down if her eyes are the murderers that she, he claims them to be. Silvus assures her that the wounds of love are invisible, but Phoebe insists that the shepherd not approach her again until she too can feel the invisible wounds. Rosalind steps out from her hiding place and begins to berate Phoebe, proclaiming that the shepherdess is no great beauty and should consider herself lucky to win Silvus' love. Confronted by what appears to be a very handsome young man who treats her as harshly as he treats Silvus, Phoebe instantly falls in love with Ganymede. Rosalind, realising this infatuation, mocks Phoebe further, and Rosalind and Celia depart, and Phoebe employs Silvus, who we can talk so well of love, to help her pursue Ganymede. Phoebe claims that she does not love Ganymede, but wonders why she failed to defend herself against such criticism. We get the sense that she's in love with Ganymede. 
In Act 4, Scene 1, while Celia, Celia listens to their arguing, Rosalind still disguises Ganymede and Jacques banter about his melancholy. And Jacques maintains that it is good to be sad and say nothing, while Rosalind maintains that if one is sad and silent, one might as well be opposed. Orlando finally arrives, very late for his appointment, and Jacques beans, beats Ganymede goodbye. Turning to Orlando, Ganymede first berates him for his lateness, but then lovingly invites him to woo Ganymede, as if Orlando was wooing Rosalind. Ganymede wit wittily instructs Orlando about the wily ways of love and women. At this point, Orlando says he must leave to attend Duke Signor at dinner and he promises to return at two o'clock. And after he's gone, Celia accuses Rosalind spe of speaking ill of women and she suggests that Rosalind should have her doublet and the house plucked over her head in order to show the world the bird hath done her own nest. And Rosalind, in answer, says that love has indeed made her a little bit mad. Now in Act 4, Scene 2, several of Duke Signor's followers have been hunting and one of them killed a deer. Jacques suggests that they present it to the Duke, like a Roman conqueror, and they carried out this slaughter trophy. Now in Act 4, Scene 3, it's past 2 o'clock and Orlando has not arrived from his meeting with Ganymede. Silvius does arrive, however, bringing Phoebe's letter to Ganymede. And Rosalind playfully pretends that, as the illiterate shepherd has supposed, it's full of invective and she accuses Silvius of writing it because it's a man's invention in his hand. But when she stops and actually reads the letter aloud, even the gullible Sil Silvius realises that the note is, in actuality, a love poem. It's Phoebe's way of wooing Ganymede. Silvius is ordered to return to Phoebe with this message. If Phoebe loves me, I charge her to love thee. If she will not, I will never have her unless thou entreat for her. Now in Act 4, Scene 3, a stranger arrives on, on stage. It's Oliver, and has come in search of Ganymede, and he presents him with a token from Orlando, a bloody handkerchief. He explains that Orlando, while walking in the forest, discovered Oliver sleeping under a cloak. A snake had coiled itself around Oliver's neck, but because it was frightened by Orlando's entrance, it slid away. Nearby, a hungry lioness waited for Oliver to awaken before pouncing upon him. After debating with himself whether to save Oliver or leave him to a certain death, Orlando fought and killed the lioness. Oliver, awakened to see his brother risking his life to save him, realised his brother loved him deeply, and so his hatred for Orlando changed to love. Now reconciled, the brothers proceed to Duke Signor's encampment, where Oliver discovered the lioness had torn Orlando's flesh. He's brought the handkerchief, which Orlando used to bind his wounded arm, and he presents it to Ganymede with apologies for Orlando's broken promise. Now in Act 5, Scene 1. When the scene opens, Audrey is fretting about her postponed marriage. She is worried and she's, seen, she's presented as a very rustic character and William appears and in answer to Touchstone's, Touchstone's question, art thou wise? He replies, I sir, and I have pretty wit. To this Touchstone responds by quoting a saying beginning, the fool doth drink think he's wise. Touchstone quickly reduces William to a state of stupefaction. William meekly goes away and Corin arrives with word that Touchstone is wanted by Lena and Ganymede. In Act 5, Scene 2, we learn that Oliver has fallen in love with Alina at first glance, and he tells Orlando that she has consented to marry him. He vows to give Orlando to his father's house and live and die a shepherd. Orlando approves of the marriage and then is scheduled for the following day. Rosalind as Ganymede enters and tells the whirlwind courtship of Alina and Oliver, in which the sooner, they no sooner looked before they loved. When Orlando confesses his own heart's heaviness because he's without his true love, Ganymede tells him that he, Ganymede, is knowledgeable in the true art of magic and says, if you do love Rosalind so near as your heart, then when, you, when your brother marries Alina, shall you marry Rosalind? Ganymede then promises to set Rosalind before Orlando's eyes. Phoebe and Silvus join them and Phoebe expresses her love for Ganymede and Silvus expresses his love for Phoebe. And Ganymede says he loves no woman, and Orlando sighs for the absent Rosalind. Now, in Act 5, Scene 3, Touchstone tells his true love, tomorrow is a joyful day when they'll be married. They're entertained then by the two of the Duke's pages who sing appropriately, it was a lover and his lass. Now, in Act 5, Scene 4, on the following day, the Duke asks Orlando if he believes that Ganymede can do all as he's promised. With them, Oliver, Celia, dis Oliver, Celia disguises Alina, Armenis, and Jacques have gathered to see whether the miracle of multiple marriages can be performed. Rosalind enters in her customary disguise, followed by Silvus and Phoebe. 
She reminds all the parties of the agreements. The Duke will allow Orlando to marry Rosalind if she appears, and Phoebe will marry Ganymede unless unforeseen circumstances make her refuse, in which case she will have to marry Silvis. Everyone agrees, and Rosalind and Celia disappear into the forest. While they're gone, Duke Senor notes on the remarkable resemblance of Ganymede to his own daughter, an opinion that Orlando seconds. Touchstone and Audrey then join the party, and Touchstone entertains the company with the description of a coral he had. As he finishes, Rosalind and Celia return, dressed as themselves and accompanied by Hymen, the god of marriage. Phoebe, realising that the young man she loves is in fact a woman, agrees to marry Silvus, and Hymen marries the happy couples in Orland, Orlando and Rosalind, Oliver and Celia, and Phoebe and Silvus, and Touchstone and Audrey get, get married, and a great wedding feast begins. Halfway through the festivities, Jacques de Bois, the middle brother of Oliver and Orlando, arrives with information that Duke Frederick mounted an army to seek out Duke Signor and destroy him. As he rode toward the forest of Ardine, Duke Frederick met a priest who converted him to a peace-loving life. Jacques de Bois goes on to report that Frederick has abdicated his throne to his brother and has moved to a monastery. All rejoice, happy in the knowledge that they can return to court. Only Jacques decides he will not return. He determines to follow Duke Frederick's example and live a solitary, contemplative existence in a monarchy in a monastery. The wedding feast continues and the revelers dance as everyone except Rosalind exits the stage. Then there's the epilogue. Rosalind steps forward and admits that the play is breaking theatrical customs by allowing a female character to perform the epilogue. But the play, she says, improves with the epilogue, and so she asks the audience's indulgence. She will not beg for the audience's approval, for she is not dressed like a beggar. Instead, she will conjure them. She begins with the women, asks them to like as much of, as the play pleases them, for the love they bear to men. She asks the same of the men, saying that if she were a woman, for all the female roles in Renaissance theatre were played by men, she would kiss as many of them as handsome and hygienic. She is sure that the compliment will be returned and the men will lavish her with applause as she courtesies. Now, when it comes to the characters, the first, of course, is Orlando. He's the younger son of Sir Roland du Bois, and he's been kept like a peasant by his brother Oliver all his life. Yet, despite this, his goodness and natural gifts are apparent. To save his life, he flees from a harsh and rigidly structured society in which the old, the lowly, and the female are victimised. In the anarchic world of Arden, he cares for Adam, who is both old and lowly, with great tenderness and no concern for rank. Most importantly, he is temporarily set free from the restrictions and fictions imposed on a man dealing with a woman and he comes to know Rosalind, not as a mistress placed on a pedestal for greater ease of worship and dehumanisation but as a friend and equal. In all, he embodies his ages Anglo-Saxons virtues of courtesy, gentleness, independence, courage of strength, filial devotion and having established Orlando as a knight of sorts, Shakespeare then reveals his human frailty, frailties, in particular when Rosalind gives him a necklace, his strength, courage and all his manly virtues desert him momentarily as he falls in love. The next character, of course, is Rosalind. She's the heroine of the comedy and she exemplifies the best virtues to be found in the Renaissance Englishwoman. She's intelligent, witty, warm, and strong of character, and she possesses an unshakable integrity, yet there's nothing overbearing or pedantic about her intelligence. She intimidates no one. As a result, she remains always gently, wittily human, whereas Orlando at times seems almost too intense in his quest to measure up to his father's precepts. Rosalind always seems to rise above the failings of fate by using her resourceful, realistic understanding, and she emerges as a human being who's to be admired. However, her patience isn't without limits, and she's no saint. Falsely charged with treason and condemned to exile, she is nevertheless secure in her integrity, and she's able to defend herself with courteous yet firm eloquence. Her exceptional mental gifts are most strikingly demonstrated during her bright flow of her conversation. She's witty, and her repartee especially is sparkling when she's alone with Celia. The other character, of course, is Celia, who's able to hold her own in witty conversations with Rosalind and Touchstone, and she's usually reserved in public situations. In Act 3, in Act 4, Scene 2, for example, she says nothing for almost 200 lines, which is to be explained in part by the fact that Rosalind is Shakespeare's principal creation, and also Celia is not in love. Also, Celia, in terms of the stage decorum, is really interestingly depicted for in many ways she never really takes part. The only role that she plays is in support of Rosalind. The next character is Touchstone, and he's designated as being the clown. He is seen and he's depicted as the fool, the king's gesture, and he's dressed in motley, and in reading Elizabethan plays, it's important to keep this important distinction in mind. 
He was, however, more than an average fool, and through his satirical wit, he exposes the follies of life. The other important characters are Duke Signor, who's banished Rosalind, Duke Frederick, who was the usurper, and Celia's father, who banishes Rosalind, uh, Arminis, the lord who attends the banished Duke, Duke Signor, Jacques, another lord who attends the banished Duke and is a very melancholy fellow, Le Beau, a courtier attending Duke Frederick, and Charles, a wrestler of Duke Frederick. There's also Oliver, who's the elder son of Sir Roland de Bois, Adam, a servant to Oliver, Dennis, a servant to Oliver, and Sir Oliver Mantex, who's a country vicar. Now, when it comes to the themes, the first, of course, is romantic love, and this is demonstrated in the central relationship between Rosalind and Orlando. They fall in love quickly, and the love is articulated through poetry and carvings on trees. It's a gentlemanly and courtly love, but it's fraught with barriers needing to be overcome. Orlando has to overcome several obstacles to be married. However, Rosalind and Orlando is uh, only met a couple of times in the disguise of Ganymede, and it's hard to say, therefore, whether they really truly know each other because we don't really see that many interactions between them when Rosalind isn't dressed as Ganymede. However, Rosalind is also interesting because in terms of her perception of love, she doesn't seem to be very unrealistic. Although she enjoys being on the wooing side of love, she's also aware that it's not sometimes always genuine, and which is why she tests Orlando's love for her through her disguise of Ganymede. There's also sisterly and brotherly love, and this is clearly evident between Celia and Rosalind, as Celia abandons her home and privileges to join Rosalind in the forest. Also, brotherly love is severely lacking at the beginning of this play. Oliver hates his brother Orlando and wants him dead, however this shifts. Also, Duke Frederick has banished Duke Sunor, who's usurped his dukedom. However, this love is restored when Oliver has a miraculous change of heart when Orlando bravely saves him from being killed. It appears in the forest that, that the forest is responsible for this change of character in both the evil brothers, Oliver and Duke Frederick, which helps further the plot in terms of the importance of reconciling, but also the importance of familial love. The other important theme is fatherly love. Duke Frederick loves his daughter Celia and has indulged her in that he's allowed Rosalind to stay. When he has a change of heart and wants to banish Rosalind, he doesn't do it for his daughter. However, once he does firm his intention to have Rosalind banished, he feels very sad when he realizes that Celia has left. Indeed, Celia rejects her father's attempts at loyalty and leaves him to join Rosalind in the forest. His love for her as his daughter is somewhat unrequited due to his wrongdoing, which he ultimately does change his mind on. Also, there's this interesting contrast between city and country life. So there's lots of pastoral literature and it thrives on this contrast. Often it suggests that the oppressions of the city can be remedied by a trip to the country's therapeutic woods and fields, which can resolve a lot of the issues that arise in the city. Also, the country is seen as restoring a person's sense of balance and rightness, and this type of restoration in turn enables one to return to the city a better person. And we see this with lots of the characters who go into the country and then come back changed. For example, in Act 1, Scene 1, Orlando rolls against the injustices of life with Oliver and complains. Later, in that scene, as Charles relates the whereabouts of Duke Sunor and his followers, the remedy is clear. It's in the forest of Ardeen where the usurp duke resides. As the characters prepare re to return for a life at court, the play does not lord country over city or vice versa, but instead suggests a delicate and necessary balance between the two. The simplicity of the forest provides shelter from the strains of the court, but it also creates a need for an urban style and sophistication. The other theme is that of foolishness, and this play makes it clear that human beings can be very ridiculous. So naturally, much of the play is spent poking fun at such foolish behaviour. From Orlando's silly notion that love should look like a 14th century Italian card, to Jacques' melancholy and highly cliched outlook on life. Touchstone, the character who does most of the mocking in the play, just happens to also be a licensed fool. Like Shakespeare's other fools, Touchstone's quick wit and insight into human nature allow him to point out the folly of those around him. Despite this place critique of human folly, it also acknowledges that foolishness and folly are the very things that make us human, and if we can recognise this, we're ahead of the game. So that's all. If you enjoyed this video, then please do consider subscribing to our channel and giving this video a thumbs up. Also, if you want access to useful essay questions, model answers that you can use for revision, as well as additional support in English, as well as other subjects, do visit our website, which is www.firstreetutors.com. Thank you so much for listening.